So guys, listen, we're continuing a series on, on uh, healthy money. And you know, anytime any church or any person stands up and says something about money, most people in the congregation say, I'm out. I'm getting on Facebook and seeing what's going on. Um, let me encourage you. Don't do that, please, because I believe that God wants to meet you fresh and anew today to to speak to you, to transform you, to change us and challenge us. And and the reality is this, for so many years, the church as a whole has gotten a bad rap. Well, the church just wants your money. That is not true, and that's not true here at Faith Bible Chapel at all. What I want as the pastor and the leadership of this church, we want this congregation to be liberated and to be able to access the promises of God that are promised to you through His Word in the area of our finances. And so I just want to encourage you, open your heart today. God's going to challenge you in a way that, that I believe is going to transform you and change you. And here's the deal. Because I'm a, I'm a pastor and I'm, and I'm a teacher, what that means is I have to teach the whole Bible. Just so you know. And part of finances is a big deal in the Bible. Jesus spoke more about finances than he did about almost anything else in his parables and his stories. Why? Because money to us is a big deal. We spend our lives. We, we, we go to school. Why? So we can get a what? Get a job. We get a job so that we can what? Make what? And, that, that's, and then we spend our whole lives working a job. And making money. Then we can spend our whole lives making decisions on how do I make more money? Where do I invest my money? What do I purchase? What do I not purchase? All these different things. And so we spend. Even some of you right now are thinking about where you're going to spend your money at lunchtime. You are. I know you are. That's what we do. We think about all this all the time. And so, so there are biblical principles that can allow God to really touch our lives and transform us and challenge us in a, in a deep, deep way. And so, and so listen, before we get into this, you need to know something. We don't believe here at the church that God wants everybody to be a millionaire. It's just I, I wish that was in the Bible, but let me say it, it's not, okay? It's not in the Bible. But Jesus taught us, though, the Scripture teaches us to be faithful for whatever to whatever he gives us. And the Bible is filled with principles that says, if you will do what the Bible says, then you can access God's blessing on your life and your finances. And it's up to God, everyone say up to God. It's up to God to determine what that blessing and favor looks like on your finances. And so we're going to step into this and believe that God changes us and transforms us. But God has given us instructions all throughout the Bible. How to invest, how to save, how to, how to, how to spend, and principles of money management. It's all throughout scriptures. And there are principles that help us have healthy money. And this is what I know. I know that money is a major deal. Most relationships, most couples, money is a major deal. Matter of fact, that money is around, it's, I believe it's the 40 to 50 percent reason or the, what, what's happening in the marriage that causes people to get divorced. Now, I know that's not actually the cause. The cause is, is, is pride and, and, and some other things that are going on. But what it comes down to a lot of times is arguing over money. I wouldn't, don't raise your hand, but think about it for a second. Those of you who are married, have you ever had a fight over money? And someone just says, yes, amen. It happens. And so it, God must want to deal with something in our lives when this as, with this aspect of money. And so what I'm talking about today, though, I believe is the most important principle about money that there is in the Bible. Because if you get this one, none of the other principles or promises will apply or work in your life. If we, if we don't get this principle, you'll never invest in the right place, you'll never save, you won't make wise purchases, and your budgets will just be like a pie in the sky that maybe one day we'll, we'll stick to a budget. Unless you get this first principle that the Bible teaches very clearly in our lives. And it's this one, one word right here. It's this word right here. Contentment. Contentment. This is a big one. It's a big one for us American people who were raised and taught our whole lives we should never be content with anything. There's always more to get. There's more to accomplish. There's, and there's nothing wrong with striving to achieve more. If your heart is content with where you are, but you're still striving to achieve more for a greater purpose than yourself. 
Because as long as, as if you're not content, as long as your, your income or your, your, uh, as long as your desires exceed your income, you're going to be in trouble. I heard someone say, as long as your yearnings exceed your earnings, you're going to be in debt. So how do we bring our, our yearnings, how do we bring our desires into a healthy place that, that still walks in the blessing of God, but also has some wisdom and some practical application? Because if, if, you, if you always desire everything you don't have, and you don't ever appreciate what you do have, what's going to happen is you're going to be in debt. And your entire life you're going to be frustrated because all you're always going to, you're always going to see is what you don't have, instead of enjoying what you do have. And until all of us really learn this principle of contentment, you're always going to be frustrated with money. There's never going to be enough. No matter how much we make, it's never going to be enough. Unless we can learn this principle in contentment. Proverbs 14.30 says this. It says, a heart at peace gives life to the body. But envy or the desire for what isn't yours or what someone else has rots the bones. So not only financially is it good to be content, it's actually physically good for you to live a content life. It actually is good for you. It is good for your health to live at peace. It's good for your health to not always be in tension. It's good for your health to not always be stressed out and freaked out and worried about money. And the Bible says that envy, this is a desire to always have more, will eat you alive. It will actually rot your bones. I think a lot of times the greatest effect really on our health is, is not just what, what we're eating, though I understand that, is, that has an effect. It's actually what's eating us on the inside. What's really happening inside of us that's driving us, that's the, 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 the mental games that we're playing, the, the desire to, 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 to achieve or to reach more, to get more. If our motives are wrong, it can really tear us up on the inside. If any of our lives is filled with worry, if it's filled with bitterness, um, resentment, anxiety, striving to get more, always to, trying to get what your neighbor has, you are only focused on what you don't have and, you're, and it's going to have an effect on your health. Do I believe that God is opposed to us, being, to us prospering? Not at all. Do I think that God is opposed to us having things in our life? Not at all. The question or the reality is what is the motivation of what you have in your life and what you're aspiring to achieve and to reach? Money, I'm telling you this morning, please hear me. Money is not your greatest need. It's not your greatest need. Contentment is. Contentment. You could even apply a contentment across your whole life. One of the reasons why divorce happens is because one spouse is no longer content with their current spouse. The reason why relationships break down in churches is because people are no longer content with what is going on. And if you think about it, the opposite of contentment is disunity. It breaks, it separates from what is true and peaceful and unifying. Hebrews 13, 5 says this. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money, the desire for always more money, and be content. Ever say content. Be content with what you have. And I want to share with you guys just some thoughts this morning about what, what are the effects of having a lack of contentment or when enough is never enough. What is the effect on your life? Number one, it will exhaust you. You will be exhausted. Today, in our, in our lives, man, we are, we are a nation of exhausted people. You can look just about into anyone's eyes, and you're going to see someone that's tired, someone that's weary, someone that just, they're like, I just need a vacation. And when enough is never enough, you're, you're always going to be exhausted. But if you're always wanting more, you're always, if you're always working harder, Guess what? You're tired all the time. And let, let me just give you a key just, just from my heart to yours. And I'm, I'm learning and growing in this in my own life. But being tired all the time is, is a symptom of trying to do too much. <laughs> I know. It's just, whoa, that's crazy. Think about it. It's very simple. Sometimes for me, some of those profound things are the simplest thing. 
If you are exhausted and tired all the time, it's probably because you're trying to do too much. You're living in a, in a lane that God hasn't asked you to live in. The race to get more, the race to, uh, to achieve more and earn more and, and buy more, I'm telling you, it is robbing families of dads and moms. The desire for a bigger TV, a bigger um, movie package, a bigger house, a, a nicer car, a vacation to this place or to that place, it is robbing families of their family. Robbing, robbing wives from husbands, husbands from wives, and the focus on our lives can become what we're trying to earn instead of building a life of relationships with each other. We are built for relationships. We are not built for money. Amen? I know it's quiet in the room. I'm thinking it's the snow. It might be the message. I don't know. <laughs> But all of us are dying, think about it, we're dying of exhaustion for the sake of stuff. Think about that. You're giving up the best of your life for the sake of stuff. I found this quote, I thought it was great. It says, most people give up their health in the first half of their life in order to get money. In the second half of their life, they give up all their money to try to get their health back. But God, how many know that God wants us to be wise? He's given us beautiful, powerful, just, just wonderful principles to apply to our lives so that we can live a life that's actually worth living. Proverbs 23, 4 says this, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. Be wise enough to know when to quit. There are things that God's going to release in your life. Some of you, God's going to pour out his, his resources on your life. Why? Because he's built you to do that. He's created you to do that. For some of us, it, maybe it won't be the case. But the reality is, we, whatever it is, we're not to wear ourselves out trying to achieve something. We're to be wise enough to know when to quit. To acknowledge our, our own capacity. There was nothing wrong with saying, time out. That's outside of my lane. That's bigger than the capacity that God's given me. Live in your capacity. Let God bless what you have so that it can be more than what it is. Instead of always trying to achieve it. So when enough is never enough, it will, number two, it will also worry you. If you live in this constant state of it's never enough, it's going to worry you. One, you're never going to be satisfied with what you have. And, and actually, when enough is not enough, no matter how much you have, you will still worry about it. As a matter of fact, if you, if, if you are never satisfied, the more you will, excuse me, <laughs> if you are never satisfied with what you have and you get more, the more that you get, you're going to constantly be rehashing that over in your mind about how you can get more and how you can take care of what you already have. And it's just if, if your heart is not to be content in what God has given you. And there's nothing wrong with having things, but, but when we worry about things that we don't have, it shows that there's something wrong. But the reality is this. We have so many things. So think, about, think about how many things we have in our house. This is the American way. We have so many things in our house that we have to rent storage somewhere else to put the things in our house so we can buy more stuff and put it back in our house. What is the logic in that? And I have a storage unit. I know. I'm, I was thinking about this week. I'm thinking, huh. So I'm paying rent on stuff I'm not even using. I'm paying rent, square footage, to put stuff in because I ran out of room in the house. And so I put it in the storage unit so my wife can go buy, go buy more stuff for the house. It just blows my mind. Now, if you, have, if you own storage units, you are in the right business in America. I guarantee you that. But if you're always desiring to get more, and, and when, when more is never enough, you're going to be tired, and you're going to worry. Ecclesiastes 5.12 says this, people who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much. But the rich, in the context of enough never being enough, seldom Get, to good, get a good night's sleep. 
Number three, when enough is never enough, it will, number three, it will disappoint you and it will dissatisfy you. We think that if we could just get more, it's going to satisfy us. We think if we can just get more, then we're going to, yes, we have arrived. But the reality is it's not the case. There are many lies that we believe in the area of money. We think that having more will actually make us happy. We think that having more will actually make us secure. Having more will make us more important or make us more loved by other people or get us invited to things that only special people get invited to get invited to, but can I just share with you some some things? None of that is actually true. Now, it's true that you can buy happiness for for a short period of time. You can roll into a car lot. You can buy a new car. You can sit in the car. You can smell the new car smell. You just feel more confident. You just feel like you've lost 10 pounds, and you just bought a car. You didn't even know what happened. And you drive away, and you, th- you feel good. You're like, yeah, I got a new car. And then, and then your, your, your uh, four-year-old leaves a sippy cup full of milk in the summertime in the back seat. And then you realize it doesn't smell like a new car anymore. <laughs> and then after a couple more years, you, thought, you think, you know what? I wish I could have a new car smell again. And you, keep lo- you start looking again. It's this desire for more and for more. Now, you can buy it for a season, but it goes away. And you're still paying for what only lasted for like a week. We can't buy happiness. Whether you buy it or not, it's not going to last when it comes to material things. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Um, How many of you are still thrilled with the things you got for Christmas last year? Let me ask you this. How many of you can remember what you even got for Christmas last year? (laughs) That's temporary possessions. We don't even know. It's short-term pleasure. And so what thrilled us last year is not thrilling us this year. So what do we need? We need more. We need the newer model. Stuff doesn't bring us permanent happiness. There's nothing wrong with stuff. Please hear my heart. Nothing wrong with it. But it doesn't bring us happiness. It doesn't bring us satisfaction. Ecclesiastes 6.9 says this, and I love this translation. It is useless. It is like chasing the wind. It is better to be satisfied with what you have than to be always wanting something else. See, the Bible Bible knows how you and I were created. The Bible knows that, that we were not made to live for stuff, stuff. We were made to make a difference in relationships with God and with one another and in the world. And so the Bible is very clear. It gives us very clear guidelines on on how how we can walk this out and live a healthy life. Because my desire for you is that we can have a healthy view of money. We can have a healthy view of stuff. We can have a healthy view of what it means to be successful. And we can understand what it means to be content. And number four, when enough is never enough, it will, number four, it will just cost you more. You're always going to spend more. It always costs more to have more. I know it's a very simple truth, but that's just the reality. It brings more expense. There's the old saying, if the grass is greener on on the other side, remember, someone has to pay to water that grass. And think about this, when we were, when we were younger, Many of us dreamt of the salary that we now have. And now it's hard to live on. Why? It's because you wanted more. And more became more expensive. And I know many of us, we think, you know, I just don't make enough money. We think we don't make enough, and and that might be the case for some people, but the truth is, Mostly the problem is we just want too much stuff. That's the real problem. We confuse our needs with our wants. And as we follow God's principles, he has promised to, follow, he's promised to provide our needs. He has promised to meet us where we are. He has promised that if we follow his principle, we, our needs will be met all the time. But many times we get upset with God because our, we think our needs aren't being met. But if we were to step back and look, we would realize actually it's our wants not being met. And now I'm angry at God because he's not doing something that he never promised to do. 
Philippians 4.19 says this. It says, God shall supply all your needs according to whose riches? His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This is the promise that God will supply everything that you need for your life. Right here. This is the problem. Either, either the word of God is true or God's a liar. I know it's a harsh statement. Well, Jason, you can't say that. But here's, here's the reality. Either this is true, that I believe. And if I feel like I am, I am in need in my life, the reality is I have to trust by faith that I must have not needed it. Because if I needed it, God would have given it to me. And I can trust in the goodness of God. I can trust in the care and the tenderness of a father that sees me for who I am. That, that he's not, you know, imagine if you bought your child everything they desired. And when they were standing at the toy, toy aisle and they said, I want that. You're like, okay, I want that, okay, I want that, okay. And so you just walk around all the time. Would you raise mature children? And the answer is, No. Now, does that child get mad at the parent for not buying them the little trinket all the time? Yes, they do. But why, why don't they get it for them? Because they don't need it. And so God is, is helping us to see our needs. And he's helping us to understand, one, that he is the provider of our needs. And that he wants to meet us where we are. Because when we are not content, it brings us exhaustion brings us worry, it brings us dissatisfaction, and it always costs us more. But I want to talk to you real quickly about how to walk in the joy of contentment. Number one, how do you walk in the joy of contentment? Is number one, we need to stop playing the comparison game. I believe the whole comparison game is all about trying to achieve a status or trying to reach a certain point in your life or trying to please man. To say, see, I, I'm, as, I'm just as important as you because look at what I have. Or look at where I live. Or look at what I post on Instagram and Facebook. I'm telling you, there are people who live the most extravagant lives on Facebook or Instagram that in all reality, they're not living extravagant lives. They can look as, as successful as they want to portray everything on, on social media. The reality is if you dig be beneath the surface, it's not real. But that's what we're confronted with all the time. We think, well, they're successful. That's what I need. I need that to, be, to be, have purpose in my life. But the reality is that's just not the case. We need to stop the comparison game. God has called you. His hand is on your life. Who you are is who God has made you to be. And let's walk in the lane that God's given us. And let's not spend our lives trying to be like somebody else. Let's spend our lives trying to be like Jesus Christ. That would, that would be the key for your freedom and your deliverance. Galatians 1.10 says this. Paul writes this. He says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Comparison is something, especially in America, that derails God's plans for our lives because we're seeking after what someone else has versus seeking after what God has for my life. You, my friends, are a servant of Jesus Christ. He has called you. He's redeemed you. He's placed his hand on your life. Your joy and your satisfaction is not found in the approval of man. It is found in your obedience to Christ Jesus, following biblical principles and following after him. That's where your joy is found. Amen? Another key for walking in the joy of, cont of contentment is number two. It's time that we start enjoying what we actually have. Because if you're always comparing, what you have is never enough. Too often we're, we're so busy going after what someone else has or someone else wants that we don't stop and smell the roses ourselves. We don't stop and enjoy what God has given us. We're always seeking and we're always overextending. And, and, and that's, that's just, that's for some reason the trap that we've fallen into. But the reality is this, do you know that God wants you to enjoy your life? He created you to enjoy your life. Not just to tolerate your life, not just to, to just deal with your life, but to enjoy your life. Your, me, your life was meant to be enjoyed, not merely endured. 
A lot of people think God is an old man that doesn't want anyone to laugh or have a good time or he doesn't have a, a sense of humor and he, just, he wants you just to be serious all the time. And, and when you enjoy life, he gets frustrated because you're enjoying life too much. That's, that's not true. God wants you to laugh. He wants you to have fun. He wants you to enjoy what he's given you. God created it all for our enjoyment. God created life for your enjoyment. Think about it for a minute. God created taste buds and then he gave us Chick-fil-A. It's very obvious. God wants us to enjoy life. <laughs> God created eardrums so that we can, we, can, we can enjoy music and we can have a worship team that enter, and brings us into the presence of God. There's no single purpose. I don't know if you know this, for music except enjoyment. God created it. God, God gave us eyes so, so we could look at the world that he, he created and gave to us in color. I, I was just in Estes Park this week with my family, and, and I'm just looking around, and just I, I'm just, I felt so close to God thinking, my gosh, you created this, and I enjoy it. And my senses are connecting, and, and, like only, I, and I'm reminded of the proverb, only a fool would say in his heart, there is no God. Why? Because it's God created the world for us to enjoy. He wants you to love your life. He gave us skin so we can feel the touch of others and experience pleasure. It's all for our enjoyment. The snow, the mountains, the sunrise, the sunsets, the beauty is for our enjoyment. God did this for you. Amen? God enjoys giving us stuff and things because he's a generous God. And he enjoys watching you enjoy what he has given you. If you want to please God, start enjoying what God's given you. Start thanking God for what he has given you. So many times in our hearts we're always, you know, I, listen, I grew up and we had, we had beans and cornbread every once in a while. I remember thinking, man, these are the best beans in the world. But some people you think, well, too bad this isn't steak. But I guess I'll eat it. Or too bad, well, if you have a steak, you're there, too bad it's not sushi. You have sushi, well, you know, too bad it's not Italian food. You have Italian food, too bad it's not biscuits and gravy from the atrium. That would be better. We're, ne we're never enjoying what God has put right in front of us. And God says, be content. Be content. Enjoy what's in front of you. Let the words come out of your own mouth. God, thank you for this bean, these beans. Thank you so much for providing for me. Every time when we say, say grace, I say this, Lord, thank you for providing food for our family. It's all we need. Imagine say, God, thank you for providing this food. Next time, can you do a little better? <laughs> None of us would say that. But we might think it in our hearts. Jesus said that I have come to give you life. What is this? He wants you to enjoy your life. First Timothy 6 says this. This is, this is tremendous. God who richly provides us with everything for our what? Enjoyment. So God wants you to enjoy what you have. And learning to enjoy what you have, it's a major piece to our contentment and walking in our contentment. And we must stop wanting and this is this whole, this whole drivenness in all of our hearts. Stop wanting to enjoy what we don't have while missing our opportunity to enjoy what we do have. And let's celebrate. Let's be a church that celebrates what we do have. Let's make, it, make, make a decision for your own family. We're going to stop comparing we're going to stop living the comparison game. It's always like, boy, wouldn't that be nice? And boy, I wish they could. Do Listen, if you need to, get off social media. It's okay. Just, you can just hide all those other people that show everything in their life. If it gets on your nerves and then get to contentment and then be able to rejoice what, what God is doing in their life. That's a real test of maturity. When you can celebrate God's blessing on someone's life that you don't yet see in your own life. That's maturity. And so God wants us to walk in freedom from all of these negative emotions. And so let's celebrate what God has given us. And I think it would be a healthy exercise for you tomorrow, even after church today. Thank God. When you walk out, so when's the last time you said, God, thank you for 
maintenance staff that make sure the, the, uh, the sidewalks are clear. You get in your car, thank you, God, for giving me a car. And guess what? You get to turn on your heater in your car. God, thank you for a heater. Whatever you have for it, God, thank you. You provided finances for me to buy food. God, thank you for, for being there for me. God, thank you for meeting me today. When In the morning you wake up, God, thank you. When's the last time you thank God for your cure egg, huh? When's the last time? Remember the old days you had to brew a whole pot? Oh, my gosh. It's like, you know, before the wheel was invented. But now you got a cure egg. You just press a button and there you go. Thank God for those things. And if you do that, something's going to trigger in your heart. You're going to start being content. You're going to start, start rejoicing in all these things in your life. Let, and let me tell parents, start enjoying your children. Start rejoicing in your child. Don't, just don't in your head, I can't wait till they get out of my house. No, 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 no. Now hang on, hang on a second. Enjoy them while they're in your house. Because one day they won't be. Enjoy what God has given you. Number three, do not live for material possessions. This is how you walk in the joy of contentment. Don't live for material possessions. Is there anything wrong with material possessions? Not at all. But Luke 12, 15 says this. Beware and guard against every kind of greed. Every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Now, I know God has called people to have resources because he's giving them the opportunity to be conduits for him and his kingdom. I know that. And he loves delighting in blessing people so that he can bless others through their lives. I'm, I'm totally aware of that. But, but wealthy people with the right perspective will tell you life is not about being, having ownership of things. Matter of fact, people that God calls to be conduits of wealth to the church and to the kingdom, if you talk to them, they, they would probably say it's actually a burden and they need God's grace to carry that. But the reality is life is not about owning stuff. It's not about putting your name on stuff. The reality is none of us bring anything into the world and none of us are taking anything out of the world. And if we want to make an impact... We cannot make an impact by trying to build a big pile of stuff on this earth. And then we'll have to rent more storage units to put the stuff in. Or I could sell the stuff, or I could give away the stuff to someone who doesn't have it. Or I could be a blessing to people because life is not about acquiring stuff. It's not. Life is not about even accomplishment. I'll tell you what it's about. Life is about relationship. It's learning how to love. It's making an impact. It's being a part of God's kingdom through investing into God's kingdom. It's, it's, it's taking a step forward to know God more in my life, which is one of our core purposes. It's taking a step forward to find freedom in areas of my life and building relationships with other people in my life so we can do life together. The purpose is for me to, to discover my purpose. Why did God put me here on this earth? He put me on this earth for a fourth purpose, to make a difference with my life, to make a difference with my finances, to make a difference with my money, to not live under the same umbrella or dark cloud as the rest of the world who are clawing to get more. And once they get more, it's never enough. That's not what God has for you. He wants to set you free to be able to enjoy what he's given you. Once you begin to enjoy what he's given you, all of a sudden, and once you begin to be good stewards of what he's given you, all of a sudden you will find that he starts to give you more things to enjoy. And the fourth one, the last one, is how do we walk in the joy of contentment is this. Number four, that we would use or you would use your life for the eternal. You have the opportunity, and I wish, I wish I would be more present of this in my own life as much as I, as much as I, I, I know it matters. But you have the opportunity to live your life in a way that will outlive you. You have, you have an opportunity before you with your investments in your life and with your family, with your children, and with your finances for you to invest in a way that's going to outlive you. And we can build our lives on eternal priorities. We can, we can invest in things that will last forever. Think about this. Nothing you see today 
is going to last forever. Nothing. It's going to rust. It's going to wear out. It's going to, it's going to go away. Every possession is temporary. Everything. This building one day will decay. This building one day will rust. This building one day will fall over. The, the trees outside one day will, they will die. They will shrivel. Everything is going to, to vanish. The fact is the Bible says one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So everything is going to be gone as we see it now anyway. But when you are content with what you have, when you, when you understand my job is to invest into the eternal, then you realize life and giving is not about a building. It's about what God is able to do in the building, through the building, with people. God's able to reach lost people. Did you guys know that this year, this year alone, and we're coming up at the end of the year, that God's used this church, you, to reach and for over 700 people have given their lives to Christ this year? Did you know that? That's, that's called investing into the eternal. Investing into the eternal. Did you know that but through what we give here as a church together that we're able to, to help families get counseling when they need it? We're able to, to help people when they're in deep need. We're, we're able to teach the Word of God. We're doing things around the world every single day from this church. Why? Because we are investing into the eternal. Listen, there's a world that needs to be reached, my friends. What's so amazing is, is what God has done here at the church, and because of your finances, what you've given, uh, next month I, I get the great privilege of, of going to Thailand, and, and they've invited me to part, be a part of the ceremony that I don't, I, I don't really deserve to be a part of, but they asked me to be a part of. And they're, they're committing a Bible that, that has been translated into an Aka language for the first time. And so now the Aka tribes have, a, have an accurate translation of the Bible. And... It's through Ajay and Nancy who have been one of our missionaries for over 25 years. They were able to do that because we are investing into the eternal. Because that's going to outlive us. That Bible's going to outlive us. I'm going to be gone and that's going to be somewhere else in some church in some village somewhere else. And a pastor is going to be reading from it. Why? Because you decided to be faithful with your finances and resources and give to a church that you're a part of. And I've shared with you before, there's going to be opportunity. You're going to get to heaven and people are going to be transformed and saved and in heaven. And you don't know anything about them, but it was because you gave. It's because you were a part of it. It's what allows us to do what God's called us to do. It allows us to have a youth pastor that, that takes care of our, 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 our teenagers and our junior hires. It allows us to have a staff for, for children that they get salvations every Sunday. Kids who are giving their lives to Jesus Christ. Guys, this is what it's about. People stepping from the, the, the darkness and the pit of hell into the kingdom of light because the gospel of Jesus Christ was able to come forth through this church and touching people all around the world. I want to be a part of that, don't you? Amen? <laughs> There's only two things that are going to last forever. The Word of God and the souls of people. That's it. That's it. This isn't about making anyone feel guilty or feeling bad for, for God blessing your life. Absolutely not. I praise God for His blessing on your life. It's about us Walking in a freedom to be content with what God has given us. And out of our contentment, guess what will be birthed? Generosity. There will be generosity that will be birthed. When you're content with what you have, you will be generous with what you have. Generous people, and I'm telling you, think about this for a moment. Generous people are content people. And they see the work of God as something to be a part of. And they see broken people as someone to be reached. They see lost people as somehow they can partner to reach them. They don't see broken and lost people as people who could take away their stuff. Content people know what, they, what God has given them. And in return, they are able to be generous to what God, with what God has given them. Two things will last forever, the Word of God and the souls of people. And so we are running our race 
And finances is a big deal. And it's the biggest, it's a personal thing. I mean, there's two things you don't talk about in church, and that's sex and money. Everything else, go for it. Don't you touch sex or money, Jason. And I've preached on them twice in the last two months. So anyway. (laughs) But this is what I know. I, I want you guys to walk in the freedom that God has for you. My desire for you is, man, you're going to get to heaven and, and you're, you're going you're to be a part of something that was so big you didn't even realize it. I want you to be able to, to, to rejoice and celebrate in what God is doing. I want you to be a part of it, to have a piece of it. Man, I'll take a piece of that. And there's always slots available for people to invest. Always slots. You can get in on the grass, on, on the ground level, grassroots of an investment that's transforming people who don't know Jesus, that's transforming families who are shattered and on the brink of divorce, but God uses the church and himself to bring them back together. Children who are lost and off the rails, God uses the church to touch them. A lost and broken world, God gives the church creative ideas to serve them. We went out as a church to serve our community, serve day. And we went out and we touched so many people's lives and we served them in the name and in the love of Jesus Christ. I keep hearing people talk about, why did you guys do that? Because we love you. We were able to do that because we are investing into the eternal. Only two things will remain forever. The word of God and the souls of people. And God wants to encourage us to invest into what is eternal. And as we're living our lives, and it's hard, guys. I I know it's hard. And we get so caught up in all kinds of stuff and what we need and we need this. Before you know it, I mean, sometimes we buy things and then later we're like, why did I buy that? Because we get caught up in this rat race. And the deal is, (laughs) as I've heard about, the problem is at the end of the rat race, even if you win, you're still a rat. But we get caught up in this, I got to go, I got to get, I got to get. And then we realize, what am I doing? And we've forgotten that our eyes have gotten off of really the true prize and onto something that actually will never satisfy us. I'm going to close with this scripture right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, the eternal. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And this is what God is inviting all of us into. That the challenge from Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 reigns true. This came out of Paul's mouth. He said this, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever 